Okay. The internet might just be slow. Yeah, I think mine is too. Um, um, but thanks for joining us, everyone. Anyways, um, we're really happy to be back at DEF CON. It looks different this year, but we're still happy to be back. Uh, as uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I love working in libraries because I get to connect people to free quality resources that they need. Free access to information is really important to me. So that's one reason why I'm in libraries. Um, Co-presenting with me again is Alex. Uh, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself real quick to the folks? Yeah, hi, I'm Alex. My pronouns are she, her, and I've been working in libraries for five years now. Um, but don't know if I can say I have any actual library experience yet because I've always been in a technology library or a technology role and can still say that I own more books than my library has in its collection, uh, which means I get to do a lot more with exploring new technologies and softwares and helping people figure those out. Yeah. Like 90% uh, of my books, so. Um, all right, scooching on here. Okay, we have a quick little overview of our presentation here. We're gonna go over um, libraries as uh, surprising early adopters of technology. Um, a cool chart that I am now obsessed with since Alex has shared it with me called the Hype Cycle. Some digital resources that you can use to improve your technology fortune telling. Um, dilemmas um, related to innovating and creating technology. Most importantly, how to get a library card in case you don't have one. And then we'll close out with some Q&A. We thanked it a bit of time for Q&A. Last time we had quite a few questions um, all about anything and everything library related. So we'll let's save those to the end and Michael will read them out for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so libraries have weirdly traditionally been early adopters of lots of different technologies. Um, in the early 90s, libraries started offering public computer and internet access. There was even one library, I think it was in New York, that like cobbled together their own shared network before like the World Wide Web was a really established thing. Um, here in Idaho, libraries have been offering access to 3D printers and virtual reality and laser cutters and cute little AI robots and stuff like since at least 2013. Um, for us as information professionals, keeping tabs on all of these trends in information consumption and sharing them with people is one of the really fun parts of the job. And one of my favorite tools for this is the um, Gartner Hype Cycle, which some of you may be familiar with um, it's on the next slide. Thank you, Ari. Um, and so the Gartner hype cycle is really great for predicting and learning about future trends. And I love it not just because of the aptly named and hilarious stages. Um, it's also just really fun to learn about and geek out about things that um, haven't come out yet. So the Gartner Institute tracks emerging technologies from the innovation trigger. So that very first point where somebody has an idea and starts working on it, um, all the way up to when it hits the peak of inflated expectations where we go, this thing is super amazing and it's gonna change the world and everything. And it's also going to fold our laundry and end systemic injustice. You know, nothing can ever actually do all of those things. So it hits that and then, it drops right back down into the trough of disillusionment where we're like, okay, actually we have to do all of these things to make this thing work. And it's not quite as amazing as we thought it was going to be before people start figuring out like, okay, so if we add these different features to the internet, like a search engine, we can use it. And it hits the slope of enlightenment before finally making it out to the plateau of productivity. And on the screen, you can see it's all color coded as well. I apologize, it's just a screenshot and real small. Um, but the colors correspond with um, how long it's anticipated for these technologies to hit that plateau of productivity. In my experience in libraries, we're usually hopping on the bandwagon around the time of the peak of inflated expectations, uh, right? As people really start talking about stuff and 
for us, that's exactly the spot where we need to be because it gives us time to start learning about these different technologies and how to use them and start asking our big questions of how can we make this more publicly accessible and how do we anticipate the average consumer using it? And when they come into the library asking for technology assistance or reference assistance on this, are we going to have enough knowledge about it to be able to assist? Um, and I like to think, you know, we sometimes help get stuff out of the trough of disillusionment and up into the slope of enlightenment. I think that's, libraries have played a huge role in getting 3D printers to that point. Um, yeah. So with that, I will let Ari share more information about our digital resources um, before going into more trends. I'm too quick on the mouse, skipping forward a little bit. So, um, okay, so we are now at my favorite part of any presentation, which is letting you know the amazing tools that we have. We'll touch on at the end of this presentation how to get one of those. Starting off with Mergent Intellect and First Research. These are a couple of my faves. Um, and for the purposes of since we're virtual today and not everyone's internet connection is as stable as they would like it to be, um, I'm referring to myself here. We're not doing like live demos of stuff. I just have some screenshots examples up in there. Um, if you're interested in live demos of things, come visit us at the library and we'll be happy to show you everything. Um, Mergent Intellective First Research, these are tandem databases that go from a macro to a micro lens. First research um, over on the left hand side with the audio and video equipment manufacturing post, it gives you these really robust predictions of industry futures. It takes a lot of factors into account. Um, you can see like a little industry growth rating down there in the corner. It does that for pretty much anything you can think of. Mergent Intellect over on the right hand side where it says Apple Incorporated, it has these detailed profiles of just about any business you can think of. Um, include things like financial data, locations, staffing size, um, historical information. They're really fantastic. I recommend these two resources a lot to people who are starting new businesses, but they're also really, really helpful in getting a sense of emerging industry trends, um, technological or not. Reference solutions uh, we found over at Meridian Library. Um, this is a great business and consumer info database. So you can find data on businesses based on location, industry, job titles, et cetera. There's like 300 different filters and attributes to sort your search through. This is a really, really handy database if you're trying to build profiles of like how many women owned businesses there are in a specific city. There's a lot of overlap with this one between Mergent and First Research, um, but this one is really, really in-depth, robust, and also specific to the Meridian Library. Morning start and value line you today. Um, I know basically nothing about investments and stock market stuff. Um, but these are two databases that are chock full of incredibly comprehensive information. Morningstar, um, all over on the right hand side with the little uh, Tesla thing there is geared toward investors who really want to make analysis driven choices about funds and market environments. And value line over on the left is full of news and updates. They have these daily reports, newsletters, surveys of up to date market information. Um, these two are really, really great for tracking trends and data in investments, um, which I know that be probably something that Clearwater focuses on too. Um, I pick one tool from this whole entire list. I hope it's this one. This is one of my absolute favorites. This is a huge conglomeration of millions and millions of searchable journal, journal articles, newspaper articles, pamphlets, ebooks, everything under the sun. You're pretty much guaranteed to find something related to your field of interest. 
Um, for example, here's a couple screen grabs here of the um, on the right hand, the Journal of Emerging Technologies in Accounting, um, and then an article on the left on uh, technological future predictions from the Astronomer Royal. Um, like I said, this one's my favorite. It has so many, you can find it at the Boise Public Library. Thinking ahead a little bit to the future, um, how are We're going to learn new software settings, um, subscriptions, but you can get it for free with your Boise Public Library card. This is a collection of video tutorials on a myriad of topics. You can choose course paths like coding, photo editing, public speaking. I have gone through a lot of Windows tutorials and I'm always impressed with the content and quality. Um, as an example on the left, there of some topics that they go over on a little segment on that. Um, so it's a great way to kind of go beyond your YouTube search for how do I fix my Excel formula, formula. Start here and learn all the basics. Let's say after all these future casting and trans research, you're interested in maybe starting your own nonprofit or just incredibly helpful when you're looking for funding. Um, right now we do have special like offsite access if you have a Boise Public Library card and I believe Meridian Library card as well. Um, it used to be that you had to like come into the library and use it there but now we can get the offsite and um, it's fantastic. I re recommend it a lot to people who are starting a nonprofit or who are looking to get funded for nonprofit projects that they're working on. To wrap some of these up, uh, we also have a million ebooks, videos, and audiobooks online. So when you need a break from all this resource, it also has RB Digital, um, as you can see down in the bottom right there for the Apple and iPhone um, Life magazines. Uh, this is a great way to stay on top of info from all the recent issues of tech magazines without having to pay for subscriptions or having stacks of unread magazines cluttering your house. Um, and again, if you want to learn about any of these, visit your library. We're happy to get you set up or you can always give us a call too. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex, who's going to talk about some dilemmas and trends that we're seeing in libraries right now. Hi. Yeah. So as I'm sure we've already mentioned, or at least hinted at, libraries are much more than books. Um, but when disaster strikes, sometimes we do have to scale back to just get back to our core services. Um, about a year ago, I was in a room with other library professionals learning about futures thinking as a practice. And we spent time imagining these future scenarios and how libraries would respond. And one scenario that the instructor brought up was imagine a library without patrons coming into the building. And we all laughed. And I'm now convinced that he was probably a time traveler because that's exactly where we've ended up this year. Uh, many libraries closed to the public and we're now starting to reopen with limited services while pivoting to figure out how to do things online like you guys are doing as well here. And while a pandemic isn't usually what people have in mind when they think about disruptions to an industry, that's kind of exactly what it's been, which got me thinking about the classic innovators dilemma of how to retain core services while staying agile enough to respond to and capitalize on a constantly changing environment. And so um, from a library perspective, if we scale all the way back, our core services are access to information and entertainment. And that is traditionally through books, but as things become more digital, that changes. Um, 
And so now I'm going to take you guys on a little journey with me through the past, present, and future of libraries, and then look at some different trends that I use to predict stuff as well um, as a way of looking at how to predict future technologies. So if we're looking at way, way back in the history of libraries, we focused solely on access to knowledge and research assistance. And like way back when in some different libraries, there actually used to be limitations on like you had to check out two nonfiction books to be allowed to check out a single fiction book, which has definitely changed over the years um, to expand to thinking that fiction is just as important for people as nonfiction. And about 10 years ago, with the advent of the maker movement, libraries started to shift again towards being more of community gathering spaces and offering access to emerging technology and different tools for people to create their own content. And then if we fast forward to now, the pandemic has forced us to roll all the way back to our core services, access to knowledge and entertainment. But it's not the only shaping force right now. Um, with the um, political climate and social media and fake news, which I really hate that term, but um, there is a larger need for fact checking and libraries have always played a, a role in information literacy. And so now we're, we're learning how to shift around that as well and offer education for people on how to check and see when something is a deep fake or um, a completely not true news story. Um, and yeah, so with all of these changes, we've had to scale way back, but still find ways to be innovative in offering our services. And that has meant a lot of curbside pickup, virtual programs, and even offering home delivery, uh, which ties into some other retail trends that we're seeing as part of the pandemic as well. And all of these changes are probably going to impact the future of libraries and other public spaces. Some of my predictions are wider use of artificial intelligence for answering reference and research questions, and I think for information literacy as well. Um, I think we're probably going to end up exactly like they did in Parks and Rec with drones dropping your books off on your front doorstep, at least at some point. And also there's going to be a lot more contactless solutions. I think some of those things are going to stay because even adding in self-check years before all of this, it's been wildly popular and some people want to be able to come into a space and get their stuff without interacting with anybody. I also think there's going to be much broader public Wi-Fi as it is something that we all rely on much more heavily now than we did six months ago, seven months ago. How It's still March <laughs> as far as I am concerned. Um, so on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind switching it for me there, Ari, I've put together a couple of different trends um, that I use to make these predictions because, well, I'm sure the future of libraries is much more interesting to me than it is to most people. I'm kind of leaning on it to illustrate how we can use different tools and thinking strategies to make fairly accurate predictions about the future. So looking at trends in a few different areas is useful for seeing how things might change. Um, so these are the four that I was kind of focusing on as I was making my predictions. The first one, obviously, remote work is happening everywhere. And with that um, have been a lot of new observations being made. Um, people are more productive, generally speaking, when they're working from home and more likely to work their full eight hours. But this whole collaboration thing is a lot more draining and people's attention span usually hits the end of about 45 minutes of a video conference is when people just can't pay attention anymore. And that goes down the longer that you're in an actual meeting. Um, and while there are tools to help with this, collaboration distance wise is a lot more difficult. Um, but another really exciting trend on that front is that people are also gaining empathy 
because they're seeing how other people's lives look. And I think that's going to shape a lot of things as we return to the workspace. And I'm hoping everything ends up being much more flexible for everyone. Um, another huge trend has been for on-demand service, which has been, we've been moving that way as it is, but then when the shelter in place order came, we really wanted that instant gratification of I'm not leaving my house, but I want my French fries at my house. And also I want to watch my movie right now. And with social distancing, that's just reinforced even more. If we can't see our friends, at least we can have our French fries. And so that is where the home delivery service that Meridian Library adopted sort of started being implemented. But now people love it so much that it's probably going to stay. Uh, and I can attest that all of the local libraries expanded their digital collections, which Ari was sharing back on the, the previous slide. We, I think, have at least tripled the number of ebooks that you can download for immediate access on your phone since all of this started. Um, and while those are definite trends that are happening, it's going to come with some new challenges. Uh, delivery style retail usually, usually requires at least 20% more square footage than traditional retail space. And while libraries aren't really retail, we have a lot of parallels to that. Um, and there's a higher demand for super personalized recommendations along with getting stuff instantly, which is where I think the AI is going to come in. Uh, the next trend, which is one of our favorite library buzzwords, is lifelong learning. And this year had many people diving into learning new skills and not just because they have more spare time because everyone I've talked to has not had more spare time even with working from home or being sheltered in place. Um, I'm hearing that teachers are joining development boot camps in droves and many people are just looking to upskill and get a stronger resume to be able to switch careers to something that's more conducive to suddenly having kids home all the time. And alongside that, there's this other trend from the business side of hiring specifically for adaptability and culture fit more than for um, specific hard skill sets. And then a statistic that we have talked about in libraries for years, and I'm not sure what the most up-to-date one is. I'm sure it's changed since um, hotspots have been being checked out, but about a quarter of American households do not have steady internet access at home. Um, and so hotspots are definitely sort of being a band-aid, but as people are required to do their doctor's appointments online and their school online and their work online, it makes me think that internet is going to start being viewed as a basic utility like power or gas and libraries already provide free public wi-fi and i can see us potentially expanding that to meet new needs or if it does just become a, a basic service with citywide wi-fi everywhere maybe libraries will stop offering public wi-fi entirely um which you know these are all the things that I'm like, well, maybe it'll be this, maybe it'll be that. And while we can't 100% predict the future, we can get a pretty good idea. And while most of my predictions are library based, a lot of these trends are going to be shaping the financial tech industry as well. And while we definitely don't have all of the answers, what we do have is the information to make plausible predictions about the future. And with a library card, you too can have access to all of these great tools to start making your own predictions about the future. And with that, I will let Ari tell you how to get your library card. Thanks, Alex. Uh, how to get a library card. Basically, you just need a photo ID and a proof of your current address. I recommend, um, since you know we're just here from Boise Meridian, there's a bunch of libraries in the Treasure Valley from Caldwell to Nampa to CUNA to Mountain Home to Ada Community. Um, so check for which library is closest to you. Give them a call to make sure that they're open. A lot of libraries in the area have different open hours and such right now because of the pandemic. 
Some have library card options where you can sign up online and get a card mailed. I know Meridian has that. Um, and some just need you to make a quick in-person stop to pick up your card. Um, right now, Boise does have to have research, can't help all of us predict like the fact that this conference is virtual instead of in person this year. Um, if you're like me and you're feeling like a lot of stress and depression about like the changes in our culture is going through right now, you might find a lot of hope and brightness in looking at these emerging future technology trends. I know that I do because amazing things are still on the horizon. We've got about 12 minutes for questions about library cards, library resources, anything that we've gone over in this presentation right now, feel free to pop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section. Michael will read them for us and we'll do our best to get you some answers. So while we're waiting for some open questions, I, I had a couple of questions that, uh, that I would like to ask. So I noticed that on your hype, the, uh, the hype curve that you were showing, that there were a whole bunch of technologies and a lot of those talked about AI and things that AI was, uh, was happening. Uh, and I guess I was wondering, are those specific because we're at a tech, a tech conference that includes AI or are these all technologies that, uh, that are the, the that AI is kind of the big trend of where things are going now? Um, so about four years ago on this hype cycle, over there on the innovation trigger was just AI. And then just over the past four years, they've been getting more and more specific as it's not just artificial intelligence. We've got edge AI and we've got emotion AI. And um, I'm not even sure what's on this one for AI. Responsible, generative, it it just um, as it expands as a field, there starts being all of these subfields within it. So, does that answer that? I just wondered. So it just seemed like there's a lot of AI on here, and there wasn't very many other things on there. And I just wondered if that was designed specifically for the conference, or if that's just the general trend that everything is really focused on AI now. I would say definitely a general trend. And out on the Gartner website, they'll have little descriptions for each of these and a little bit more information about those specific AIs. You can also look at past type cycles as well. Um, they have one from the last couple of years that are really interesting to look at to see where we were a couple of years ago for different technologies. Another thing that came up inside the, the presentation that surprised me is you were talking about delivery style and that you said delivery style requires larger building uh, footprint. And I was wondering that uh, that's surprising to me because I see that, uh, that with the at home delivery and remote delivery that uh, that things are taking up a smaller space as opposed to taking up more space and I wasn't sure if I was misinterpreting that or I definitely thought that was a weird one too uh, because it it didn't line up with what I thought there is um a a link to the study for that it was a state of retail trends study from this year and um, a lot of what it comes down to is when you're moving to a delivery model, um, you need more packaging space and you need more inventory. And um, it might not be as applicable on a super small local scale, but um, Home Depot, for example, just realized that they can't ship out of all of their own stores because they don't have the space for it. So instead they're building warehouses close to their major delivery city um, areas. So um, we're seeing that here as well with all the new Amazon fulfillment centers that we're getting. And that just shortens the delivery time, but does apparently take more square footage than just opening a storefront. Yeah, that, that was- a, oh, Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Oh, no, that was a, I had to make sure I read that one right too, because it, 
didn't line up with my expectations. On a smaller scale for libraries, I know that for at least like the, the main voice public at this point, um, like we have had, even though we're not doing delivery, like we're rating is because our city is a, a bit bigger, um, but we've been doing a lot of curbside pickup, which we have not done before. And um, we had to drastically increase the size of our hold shelves where we store books for people to pick up. Um, extra space is being taken up by um, just even the little bags that we use to put things in for people. Um, so counter space and floor space uh, have, needs have definitely expanded for us. And then kind of library specific again here, but we don't actually have space for all of the books in our collection to be in the building at any one time. And when everybody returned all of theirs all at once, we had to figure out space for it because we assume that a certain percentage will always be at people's houses and not in the building. So that's been an interesting obstacle. Yeah. <laughs> I always forget about that. Materials that are returned, like right now, uh, the main library, we have two big meeting rooms on the first floor and those are both chock full of just books stacked up waiting for germs to die. Yep. At Meridian too. Oh. Do we have any other questions from folks? Anyone need info on getting a library card or anything? If you do think of other questions later, we do have our contact info on here and you know, we can help with the library card, but also if you just have weird specific questions about future trends or anything that we talked about here, we love discussing all of that as well and helping you find more resources to dive into it. Actually, I've got one more question for you that's actually a library specific question. Okay, Ooh, go for it. <laughs> so I've noticed that when I check out an, an ebook, uh, that, uh, that, that I usually get it for two weeks and that I can't check it out again, that, uh, that usually I, I get it and that's, you know, I, I basically, especially if I'm using one of the new books that I'm not able to extend that time and yet some of them are very difficult to get through in two weeks. And I wondered if there's any talk about maybe making that three weeks or uh, extending that time a little bit or anything along that lines. Not to my knowledge, um, ebooks are super popular. Um, if it helps, it's two weeks for like everything, not just new books. Um, uh, I know some people do like put holds on things like immediately after they have to return them. And um, there is a return early option. So if someone has it checked out, they can return it early. Um, as far as extending that, um, ebooks and libraries have a, 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 a long intense history. Um, <laughs> because of um, like the publisher rights for ebooks. Um, a lot of the times, Oops. the ebooks that we do have, um, some one publication. Um, so um, unfortunately that means that we don't have uh, unlimited amount of access to versions in the same way that you could like share out a PDF to everybody at once. It's like having a PDF for a class and one person at a time gets to read it. So that's another reason why those limits are a little bit shorter, just so that we can give everyone a chance to get to them. So I noticed that, uh, that we've got a question. Uh, so are you still Ooh. checking out DVDs or uh, it says those had a pretty limited time and does that cause problems? So yes, we are still checking out DVDs um, and uh, something that I don't think that we've mentioned is we are all fine free now as well. So you are not going to pay late fees, um, which means, you know, stuff is sitting there getting quarantined for a week after you've returned it. You're not accumulating late fees for that. And if you forget to bring it back in time, no late fees. Yeah. 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 Still checking out DVDs. Um, I believe, is it two weeks or four weeks for like fiction movies? um it's pretty yeah. long uh-huh yeah i think it's two weeks i think the only things not in circulation right now are um board games and some of the different kits that we have mm -hmm. um 
Yeah. Yeah. For us at Boise Lake, if you have kids who are used to like checking out like toy packs and stuff like that, um, we don't have those available just because uh, they're a lot. A lot more difficult to sanitize. All right. Well, that seems to be the questions. And uh, so since I don't see any more questions, I think we'll go ahead and, and end the session. Thank you very much for attending. And thanks for the, uh, the really interesting information. And uh, there are some things out there that I didn't know were out there and looking forward to checking out myself. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for having us. All righty. We'll talk to you later. All right. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.